which is an oil-based product, is going to dry out and go bad or crack within 10 to 12 years. Or so, and you're going to have a leak. You'll lose your air pressure and your window's going to fog up. So it's a built-in obsolescence item. We're designed to break every 10 to 12 years. Of course, your warranty is 10. That's why it doesn't break till 12. But the point of this is, is that if I have to go back in and change out not only the glass, but the vinyl around it, and pull, pull everything out and replace the whole damn window every 12 years, it is not cheap to make glass. You have to pour molten glass over the top of molten aluminum nowadays. That's how they make it. So you're having to heat up that sand to make the glass, and then you're having to make the vinyl out of oil-based products, which creates more toxins, and then you're going to transport it out to somebody's house, tear out the old one, put the new one in, and throw away the vinyl. So you got a disposable, built-in trash for the future, and a future of having to spend more money to make more vinyl, make more glass every 12 years. Or I can use a window that's been around for 130 years, it was hand-blown by my ancestors, um, and put in, and still functional, made with wood that's hundreds of years old that won't rot. That's what this is all about, is that I can do that instead of supporting the industry that's saying, got to come back for more, got to come back for more. I don't want to go back for more. I want this to last 150 years, just like it did the last time. Uh, I've got an a, a, a idiot on here uh, on my chat room that says, would you tell your guests that these uh, standards are supported by my people to ensure safety? We kicked him out of um, the room, but what, yeah, I, I, what about I that? Think uh, yeah, safety right now. Building code in today is, is basically uh, an insult. Um, for example, it's perfectly acceptable safety-wise to use sheetrock. Now, sheetrock happens to be about 40% fly ash and 60% system, and the reason they do this, fly ash coming out of the tops of the chimneys of the electric plants is hazardous waste if you just take it in full, pure form. By mixing it with gypsum and diluting it, you now have a product that you can sell with a couple pieces of paper wrapped on the outside of it called sheetrock. And in the process of making that sheetrock, they use a recycled water that is the nastiest, nastiest stuff you ever saw. And in with that comes industrial mold. The industrial mold is the great, the black mold that will actually destroy your health if it gets out there. And all you have to do to bring it out is to take a squirt bottle and go over and squirt a piece of brand new sheetrock and make it nice and wet on the surface so that it soaks through the, um, the paper and gets into the gypsum. And you will see, amazingly, black mold develop on the surface of the sheetrock generally. And the reason is it comes with it inside the sheetrock. So let's talk about a standard that somebody promotes and puts into your house. Not to mention, of course, that it also outcasts us because of that. And the Chinese shoe rock that's gotten all the attention had a little bit too much salt and a little bit too much fly ash in it. Well, coincidentally, Americans are making the same thing down in Miami, and there are Americans down in Florida who are trying to press lawsuits against those companies whose labels on that shoe rock that are American labels that they made it, but nobody will take the suits. Nobody will file the suit against them because it's American. Now, that's not safe, but it's required by code. People use it all the time. Let's go into carpet. I had a lady come through here, the carpet that she used, which was acceptable. Um, 30 physicians in the Colorado hospital finally figured out that the carpet was um, giving off so much formaldehyde that that's why her son was on the on body. The 30 physicians were trying to figure out how to save him, and it turned out the best way to save him was to pull all the carpet out of the house and eliminate the formaldehyde hazard that was killing him. Um, I have one example after another, after another, after another of this going on. If the standard is to make it safe. Why would you require somebody to put vinyl windows in a house and vinyl outgasses a hormone mimicking chemical into your environment? So your child is actually sucking in hormone mimicking chemicals that actually cause damage to their body. Um, so you got formaldehyde, you got chemicals in the glues, you've got chemicals coming out of the sheetrock, and then you throw latex paint into it, and that actually is horrible on the immune system. In fact, people that have compromised immune systems can't even be around fresh latex paint in a room or a hotel. So you're throwing that into the mix, and you're calling that safe because it, it goes to code, because code allows it. Well, the industry has allowed all sorts of poisons to be introduced into our environment because they control code. So if one thinks that that's making us safer, allowing all these terrible things to be put into our environment because now it's code, then I want the person to answer for all the bad things allowed to go in under the auspices of being better for our environment or better for our people or better because we're tearing down something, making plastics and leaving all these chemicals all over. The standard was made to eliminate the competition or to force us to do things that we don't necessarily want to do. I, I don't want the double thing insulated glasses in, in glass in my house. It's required by code. Code is a tool of the industry, of the corporations, to force us to do what they want us to do, in spite of the fact that it's not good for America. You know, you mentioned earlier that uh, the fact that uh, We've got so much uh, available lumber here, if we're salvaging instead of throwing away and putting it in the dumps. Uh, 
but uh, uh, 50 years ago or more they stole our number one cash crop that would have replaced all of the use of trees for paper and that was hemp Oh, absolutely. And more than that, hemp seed, for example, provides the best protein resource for male that you can take. Um, it also provides a number of other things. The, the Bible pages um, and the Bibles that the people brought over from uh, um, in Jamestown, they were made out of uh, uh, hemp. The sails were made out of hemp. The ropes that were on the ships were made out of hemp. Um, it, it, in World War II, we actually promoted growing hemp all over our country because we needed the rope. Um, it is a faint takeaway cash crop from the public that needs it that would replace tobacco. And tobacco we know to be hazardous and poisonous and damaging to our public, and yet we allow that to be grown without any hesitation. We allow that chemical to it even causes the worst cancers in the world, but we won't let them grow hemp. Now, this is an industry issue. This is uh, the chemicals um, that can be produced, the, the fibers can be produced. There's all competition to what already exists, so we don't want that to happen. And same as the pharmaceutical industry doesn't want the many, many, many benefits, medicinal benefits of marijuana to be um, used by the public through using marijuana. They want to go ahead and make it a chemical that has to be absorbed through their pharmaceutical pills. Um, that's why it's been kept illegal. In the meantime, we know it's good for a million different things from diet to men menopause to menstrual cramps to um, back pain to any other number of things. We know the medicinal benefits there, even to the point that our VA prescribes marijuana for post-stress disorders and that is medicinal benefit and I understand it. So if my government in one department is saying it's medicinal and the other department is saying it has no medicinal benefits, the hypocrisy of it is in its own self evidence that it needs to be changed. We need to make it legal for both hemp and for pot. Why throw people in jail for something like that? That's insane. Any time, any, I, I have been telling people this for about 50 years. Anytime a man with a badge can walk up to you and say, what's that you got in your pocket? It smells like marijuana here. Ah, uh, you're going to have to go to jail. You live in a police state. And this is not, this is not just a, a movement. This is education. This is what you need to know, folks. The, the DuPont, you, you mentioned the vinyl in the, in the windows. Well, let's right. see, the, the main competitor to, uh, hemp is nylon created by the DuPont company financed by the Mellon Bank and uh, so so we're not allowed to have hemp I mean 10,000 products made out of hemp we gotta buy it from Red China why is that? Oh well, we get it from Canada Canada we get tons of hemp from Canada now that's right hemp clothing all sorts of hemp products they're making billions of dollars off the hemp industry in Canada because we can't have it here they were worried. Canada, the Canada was really worried that they were going to legalize marijuana in California, and that would have cut their uh, income in half. Yeah, and, and and one of the issues we've got to contend with is, and even in, and even right now, LA is shutting down 800 clinics um, because what happened was, is like anything, it went all the way to the excess. You you, you know, can't have a clinic at each end of the block where people can come in and just buy pot. It's like having liquor stores at every everywhere, in the sense that you're going to have activity going on that somebody's not going to want to have and consequently they're going to protest it. Um, I, I think that the, the idea of this um, freedom in America, period, the freedom to make our choices, if I want to eat organic food, if I want to take vitamin, those are our freedoms that we should be protecting. In Europe, they've already taken away vitamin B6 and B12 out of the vitamins. They've determined that that's a poison. And uh, so they're not allowing B6 and B12, which happen to be our energy vitamin, our ability to to fight back and resist depends on our ability to have enough energy to stay awake and do it. So what they've done over there is they've eliminated the energy vitamins out of their whole diet and somehow justified it. But that's part of the UN. That's right. part of the whole UN. And if you get into it, the plan, of course, to eliminate the nutrition that we need to stay healthy. Now, in, in these stores that you're talking about, I, I also, I, I would, in my in my imagination here, I would envision being able to come in there and see alternative electricity, wind generators, all that can be created in the same environment, in the same uh, manufacturing enterprise style as as your houses. And so oh, absolutely, and every one of the outposts is supposed to be that. When you come to an outpost, it'll be a health center where you can come in and learn about how to stay healthy without using pharmaceuticals. It'll be an education center where the, the kids can come in and not necessarily learn how to be an electrician but learn how to electrify a house, how to plumb a house, tiny house, or learn how to plumb a 
a, a, a house. But the idea being that you can learn what you need to know to build a house or to be participating in helping other people build houses without having to be an electrician who can wire a factory or an electrician who can wire an entire apartment complex. That's not necessary. What we do need to do is be able to make it so a homesteader in Texas, if you are doing your homestead, <clears throat> if you're building your own house, you're allowed to do your own wiring, you're allowed to do your own plumbing, you're allowed to do everything yourself in Texas if it's your homestead. So all I have to do is teach them how to do that part, and you can build your own house. And that's what this is all about. And that's you, what this is all about. The, I, I, keep, uh, I, I keep going back to the, you know, the Amish, when, when people got together to build a barn, to build a house, I mean, if... Well, yeah, if barn raisings, yeah. That, that uh, without without paying these bankers, I mean, eventually, I I believe well, that's what this is about. It, that's it. it. You know, yeah. We can be self financing here. We can uh, if you've got uh, you got an investment, you know, help help well, somebody get uh, get into a house, and you take the uh, the uh, reasonable interest instead of this usury. Uh, there is no interest. First of all, if you're, no if you're a first-time right. living member, there is no interest on loans. Great. We don't believe in that. Okay, okay. that's basically the whole thing Jesus is saying. There's the money money changers. You charge an interest on what? For what? No. We don't charge interest. The whole idea is, is let's just say, for example, we had, uh, you look on YouTube, you can see um, the El Campo expedition. When you've got three women over 49 and three kids under 30 and uh, a couple other people, myself, take down a house, two-story house, in nine days. And that's deep wood walls, ceiling, sundry floors, two by fours, one by twelves, all that in nine days. That's enough material to build three houses. We can build a house every ten days, a tiny one, that somebody can live in, have their bedroom, have a little living area, have a bathroom in it. We can build one of those every ten days. So that means in 40 days, eight people could take a house down and build three tiny houses that a couple could live in, each one, um, for free, virtually for free. I mean, you have some materials you have to buy, but you have to sell off the materials you don't need to buy the materials you do need. So, in effect, six people, eight people can go in, take down a house, and create themselves housing in a 40-day period without using any money. That's what this is all about, teaching that, because that's all bartered exchange, that interest-free housing that doesn't cost you anything other than human energy and creating a community, working together with somebody else to make it happen. You can't do it all alone. But that's the whole idea. You know, that's, that, that's right. Just like I, you said, the barn raising, that's what this is. It's a barn, it's a house raising with a Z, taking it down, and a house raising with an S, putting it back up. And it's all done with human energy, American ingenuity, and a sense of community that builds, again, that American ethos that we once had. That's what I'm after. I think you've got a, a real good grasp on it, and uh, this is a uh, you know this is this is something that is duplicable, folks. I mean, you can take this to any part of the country and and do this. I, and and the, the the real secret here, I think, is what you just said: working with each other. Now, what they, the the enemy tactics and the government tactics is to keep you afraid. To keep you afraid of me, to keep you afraid of them, can we, can uh, divide, right? And divide and conquer. That's what it does. That's exactly it. And then turn each other, everybody against each other. Our our, our villages, the tiny Texas territories, is to prove that you can bring the the liberal right and the conservative, um, I mean, the conservative right and the liberal left together in the same in the same environments. You can we can live together, we can work together because we have a common cause. The common cause is to save our planet, to save our species to save our society in a new form, in a better form. We've destroyed it as it is right now. But we have all these motivations, all these incentives for us to work together as a country, but also as a planet. And this is where we've got to move to the next level, as a planet, as a species, not as Chinese, not as Americans, not as Afghans, not as Russians, as, as human beings, as human beings sharing this planet. We've got to figure this out pretty darn quick. We don't have much time left. And it's not going to be by shooting each other and killing each other that we're going to go ahead and find peace. I don't believe that. You can never find peace with the children of the man you killed. And, and you killed his mother, you killed his father. You don't think he's going to come back and try to kill you? That's insanity. So we can't win this by killing people. We've got to win this by, by winning their hearts and souls and minds. And we've not seen that. And so we're wasting our money. We're wasting the energy. We're wasting our, our children, our boys who are committing suicide. Six for every one that dies in war. 
because we are not doing the right thing. And the cost to our society is our children, and it's our future. And, and the government doesn't seem to care about that because they're not concerned about the society. The government, in my opinion, is 100% concerned about the, the corporations and the survival of the 1% who own most of the country. As long as that is the primary motivation of the government and not the people that they're supposed to be taken care of, then we don't have a chance. So my concept with Tiny Texas Houses is to start moving us back toward thinking about the individual, the person within, and what we as individuals, how simple we can live and then turn our energies back out to doing something good, to paying forward for our children and our grandchildren what they're going to need to survive and quit worrying so much about getting everything we want and don't need now. We're just gluttons. We've got to stop. We've got to set a new example. We've got to lead the world to a different end. Right now, we're leading them into a hole. Everybody in the world expects 3,000 square feet and two cars and a family and four TVs, and it can't happen. So we have to set the example. We have to take responsibility as adults. Our generation has to finally come around and say, let's show it can be done. Let's prove to our children that we can actually intentionally leave them something and not just destroy their lives with leaving them with debt and military that is absolutely gone insane. You know, your when your your description of what you are, it it, it evokes uh, a lot of, of information that I've had uh, that I pulled out over the last hundred years. You what you you're talking about the central unit with the the you know where where people can come in and be educated. There was something at the turn of the century called Chautauquas around the country. And people were going around and teaching and talking to uh, other Americans. It was uh, it was a little. It was more than a political movement. It was uh, it, it, before the internet. It's the way people got their information, and the internet's a great to spread this. You know, the fact that you had so many millions of hits on this is a good thing. But people need to be able to touch something. They need to be able to see something because a lot of people aren't capable of, of, of carrying the thought the way you have to its ultimate completion. So it's uh, this, this is uh, the, the teaching aspect of what you're doing and in combination with Liberty Villages is really, you know, I, I see it as being the most empowering movement on the planet right now. How to be well, more self-sufficient. I agree with that. And since it's your Liberty Villages, the concept is liberate people um, from being slaves and being drones by reintroducing the Bill of Rights and the Constitution to people who don't understand what it's supposed to ensure, what it's supposed to guarantee, what it actually stands for, because most of them know they don't even read it anymore. They, nobody reads it. It's not even required in school. And so, I agree, we need to teach people the principles on which this country was founded, in spite of the fact that they've been bastardized as badly as they have. Um, the concept of Liberty Village, the concept of having places, islands of effectively free thinking is important and it can't be restricted to any left or right or religion or anything else. The whole idea is everybody has this right to have a village that offers them the liberty that they want. And, and I think that that's the real big point here is this should happen all over the country instantaneously. The materials are out there, the human energy is out there. The knowledge of our elders who really know how to get by and to do this is still out there. And we have to download all that information from the 80-year-olds and the 70-year-olds and the 60-year-olds down into the 20 and 30 and 40-year-olds. If we don't start transferring that knowledge now and downloading, it's going to be gone in a few short years. And with that goes all of the, all of the intelligence, all of the experience that was what made America great, and that's our elders. And we forget that all the time. They're the ones that could grow without Monsanto. They're the ones that could heal without pharmaceuticals, they could heal with herbs, and they could do all these things before science and electricity came along and destroyed our brain. Yeah. And this is what I am so adamant about. We've got to save the knowledge from our elders, go back and respect them, give them respect their due, because my generation came along and said, you guys don't know nothing, we got plastic, we got electricity, we got all this stuff, you just old folks, you just step aside, and we're going to show you how it's done. And we spent the last 40 years showing them how we could destroy the economy, destroy the family unit, destroy the principles on which the country was built, destroy the work ethic, and destroy the quality that we were so proud of, American-made. That's all been done by our generation, I'm sorry to say, 
we've done it. And now we're handing off to our children, the new generation, the decimated remnants of a country and a society that was once great. And I, I, I think it's just sad if we ignore this opportunity to go back to being simple, community-minded, public-oriented, payback people that we were in the 50s and the 40s and before that. We had 1,200 square foot houses and we cared about our family more than the things that we had so we don't even see our family in order to be able to go out and work and earn those. That's what we're missing. Our generation screwed it up. Now it's time to go back and try to learn how to do it right again. That's, that's I honestly believe, the only way we're going to pull it out. We can't go forward in the direction we're going indefinitely or we're going to destroy ourselves. And I, I think by people, uh, if we network these independent villages, I mean, you know, there's a lot of places yeah. I, I don't want to go. I like Texas. I like I like where you're at right now. This is if I've got if I if I have a choice about where I want to live, that that would be the place. Now that you, now, now that you don't have a, now that you don't have a helmet law, I can come back. <laughs> well, um, hopefully, hopefully the Lone Star State will stand up and step out. We have the right to pull away. We're the only state in the union that has the right to pull out of the 50 states. And uh, in my honest opinion, since we're the eighth largest economy in the world, we have our shoreline, we have everything we need to survive as an independent nation. Texas could do it. And I'm of the school that we should. At some point, we will. Well, because we won't be able to continue to pay the burden of the federal government, which is not our burden. That's, that's we're not in war. We didn't make that choice. The federal government made that choice. So let them go ahead and bear the load. But as far as I'm concerned, Texas needs to pull out, become independent, and start representing the individual, and as it did when it was the Texas Republic. That's interesting because my books, One Mystery, Babylon, New World Order, Unveiled, One Bloody Alabaster Eye, Deadly Flashes of Silver, are published by the Texas Independence Movement. So we will definitely weave that into the whole thing. We've got the, we've got the people there in Austin that will uh, be carrying this message across. Randall mocks uh, people there. Who you've already met, you know, we've already we've already met a lot of the people here. And folks, it's just about working together. This can be done. You know, I'm not looking and, and, and the timeliness of it. This is important. It's the timeliness of it. And that we're at a point now. If anybody looks out the window, looks out the door, reads the newspaper, watches what's going on, we're at that point. The time is here. We need to respond. We need to react. We need to move in some direction other than just settling down the stream, paddling down the stream like we are, because we're headed for the waterfall. And so we need to figure it out. We need to figure it out. This, this movement of people that are thinking this way, they're thinking about these villages, they're thinking about these tiny houses, about downsizing, this is not just something I created. This is something that was already in motion. This is part of our generation, 76 million people waking up. We weren't supposed to get this old. We're about to retire. We don't have anything. Or our retirement's just been sucked up by the system. Or they just tricked us and taken it all away through inflation. But the point of it all is, is that there's a whole lot of people waking up to this. This is a global consciousness coming about that we all are starting to feel and realize that we're connected. That we can no longer sit there in our own little room watching TV by ourselves and think that we are not connected to the person down the street. When the power goes out, we're all connected. That's and right. And, before and the power goes out, we need to understand that and reestablish that community that we're going to need if and when the power goes out. And I'm of the conviction and of the belief that it will, and it is imminent. And all you have to do is go to something like solarstormwarnings.com and wake up. Just look and see the facts and see the science and understand why things are about to change. That's right. A lot of people can't handle it. A lot of people don't even want to know. A lot of people got their heads so yeah. deep in the sand, they're never going to pull it out in order to be able to see what's coming. They want that semi-truck to run over them with them totally ignorant of the fact that it's coming so that they'll never have to worry about it. And I'm not at that school. I'm at the school that we need to know, we need to prepare, and we need to be ready for our, our, our community, our friends, our families to join together and to reestablish a sense of unity we haven't seen in 40 years. Uh, folks, you know, I've been demonized a lot for starting the militias. I still believe in the militias if they're done the right way, which is the way I did it in the office of the governor, or the way they've done it down in uh, South Texas along the border there. 
the militia works for the sheriff. Now we've got a lot of good sheriffs out there and the, those sheriffs in the Department of Agriculture in Texas have told you that we're in a war along the border. We're in a war down there and we really need to work with our farmers and our ranchers to protect them. We don't want to repeat what happened in Rhodesia or South Africa or the Ukraine or the Soviet Union here. We don't need that here and we can avoid that. We've got the information. We've got the technology. We've got the information. The people like Brad are the people that will lead us into a different way of life and, and I highly approve of the way of life. Now I designed Liberty Villages. When I when I thought of our uh, Liberty Villages, it'll be a covenant community. It'll be all in writing. This is what this is what we you, you, you need to do if you want to be a part of this and be interconnected. You have to be able to grow your own food, generate your own energy, and, and support each other, work together as a community. Here's one business, here's a business, here's a business that you can uh, that you can handle. And folks, this is a uh, we can do that. I am basically taking applications right now. Yeah, and and and, and what I'm looking for at this point with the first of the Texas territories is to establish the the um, the blueprint effectively for other villages to be able to come about. Other other the, the one acre villages basically join together to form townships, and each little village has its own you know. Um, it's small as it is, 10 or 12 people, you're still going to have the chief, the person who's designated to go and speak for your little village in the group. That's right. And the group gets together. It sounds like the Indians did or anything else. These are traditions that go back for centuries. Sure. And each group is represented. That's what this is all about, is showing we can do it, proving it can be done, and getting people to come here who want to invest some time, some energy, some money into making, say, a village for the fisherman village or for the organic growers village or for the quilters or the bridge players or the elderly village or the veterans village but I would like to see people come in and say okay I want to be responsible for that village I'll invest some some money I'll put my house in there I'll maybe put some other houses in there and I can owner finance them or use them to lease them out to some of these people they could come in and be able to learn this and do this so we can spread it and leapfrog and start another outpost we should have pure salvage outposts every 150 miles down every highway across the country so that you don't have to drive more than 75 miles with a 16 foot trailer and 2,000 board feet of lumber and a buddy to unload it. Because after you get more than that, you can drive a semi truck for the same price. And I can just stop and pick up what's on the way. Um, there's lots of things that we can do to expedite this and make this possible on a co op basis. We create co ops. Each one of these two side with outposts is a co op. That's right. And, people get together. and folks, that it's means. It's all about the unity of the locals and the locals defending this pure life resource center. That's what pure salvage outposts are. They're all the wood, all the windows, all the doors. Bring in your fishes, trade them in. Bring in your furniture, put it for windows and doors. Or scholarship for your kid to learn how to do stuff. The idea is pure salvage outposts will be living resource centers all across the country that preserve the assets, the resources that we have in hand rather than throwing them away so that our children, when they come around understanding the value of them, will be able to have them again and use them again. So you can go in and literally barter for your dishes, your furniture, your windows, your doors, everything you need to live with nothing but your human energy. Help somebody else on their project. You'll learn a window, you'll learn a door. Go in like right now, to help tear down a building. For every three windows the guys pull out, they get to keep one. For every three doors they pull out, they get to keep one. That kind of thing will make it possible for everybody to have housing without ever spending any money on it. That's really, really, really and, important. And folks, what, uh, what better time to do this than when one million peop Americans have lost their homes to the bankster scams? And oh, and when six women out of ten that are living on the street are veterans that right. served in the war that have been abandoned by our country that have no house, that right. have no family because they gave it all well, up to go off and fight in a war. All right, so we're out of here, here, guys. Uh, Brad, I'll be talking to you later on today. I, I'll be talking to you later on today. Okay, and, uh, we'll do that. Give me the information I'm going to need, and then I'm going to be running around all day. i got to go to San Antonio once, so I'll be on the road. But I can get back and do wire. Wire has to go out by 12, so if I don't have information by 12, that money won't leave. I'll, I'll find out, sir.